All right, so welcome back. This is going to be our second and final screencast for Chapter 22, uh, the echinoderms. And what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and look at the feeding and digestive system of these animals. We're going to make our way through a discussion on the nervous system, maybe a little bit about the excretory system, look at some reproduction, and um, then, of course, talk about the different um, other classes that fall within the phylum echinodermata. So the first thing we need to do is we need to remember that all of the anatomy pieces that we are looking at in regards to this group, the echinoderms, is going to focus primarily on the starfish or those members that belong to the class Asteroidae. And what we're going to do is we're going to look at the feeding and digestive system of these particular animals. Now, when you look at their digestive system, it's a pretty simple digestive system. Their mouth, which remember is going to be on the oral side of the body of the animal. So down here, if you notice, we have sort of a cross-section of the central disc of the echinoderm. And you can see the mouth located right down here. So it's on the oral side of that animal. Remember, oral means mouth. And it's going to lead through a very short esophagus. And you can see that esophagus right through here. And then it's going to make its way into the cardiac part of the stomach. And so we have two sections to the stomach. We have a cardiac stomach. And then we have one actually right up here that is going to be considered the pyloric stomach. And that's where the pyloric cica, which is um, simply a digestive gland, is going to branch off of and it's going to help the animal to digest its food. Now what's kind of neat about the um, echinoderms, in this case the starfish, is they can actually take their stomach and they can evert that stomach, which means they can actually protrude the stomach um, through the mouth of the animal. So if you look towards the top of the screen, this area right through here represents the everted stomach of a starfish. And what they'll do is they'll evert the stomach and simply wrap that stomach around the prey and begin the digestive process. Now, again, as we had said, the upper stomach, which is going to be this part right through here, is considered the pyloric stomach, and that's where the pyloric seek are going to branch off of. And again, they're just simply going to secrete some digestive enzymes and to um, further along the digestive process. Now, the anus, which is going to be very inconspicuous, which means really difficult to see, is going to be on the aboral side of the animal. So if you remember, you were really, um, it was pretty easy to identify the madrepori, that entrance into the water basket system, but it was really difficult for some people to find the anus on these animals. So again, just kind of know the location of where it should be in the starfish. Now, the second system that we look at is um, essentially the circulatory system of the starfish, and what we do is we call it the hemal system. Now, remember, hemal is going to refer to the blood or the blood-type fluid that you would find um, circulating throughout the animal. Now, this is going to be a system simply of tissue strands that are going to enclose what we consider unlined sinuses. Now, the echinoderms really don't have a very well-structured circulatory system. And so everything that you see over here on the right-hand side that is dictated by the name hemal is going to fall into this system. And if you notice, it's pretty simple. Again, this being the oral side, this being the aboral side, we have two what we consider hemal canals, or sometimes they're called hemal rings. They're going to be found um, on the top and the bottom of the animal. And those two hemal rings are going to be connected by various what we consider complexes. And, you know, it's been kind of um, a debate as to what this system is really used for, because if you look at it, it's not really a well-structured um, circulatory system in regards to blood flow. But there is some speculation that they actually use this system to distribute nutrients um, throughout the animal. Now when you look at the nervous system of a starfish, you're going to notice that the system itself is actually pretty simple. They have what we call an oral nervous system. In other words, they have a simple nerve ring, which is going to be found in the um, aboral side of the animal. And they have a series of radial nerves, which are going to run actually into each of the arms or rays of the starfish. Now, these nerves are going to be used to coordinate or to regulate the contraction or the um, extension of those tube feet. So down here towards the bottom, you're going to notice we have a cross section of one of these rays or arms. And you're going to see the podium, which is another word for the tube feet, um, located right here. And the radial nerve is going to be situated right down the middle of that ambulacral groove, which contains those tube feet. And so it would make sense that those radial nerves are going to be used to sort of regulate the movement of those podia. 
Now, they do um, describe the nervous system of these animals as a hyponeural system, which hypo would mean above. So we're looking at a nervous system where it's basically in the aboral region of the animal, so it's going to be aboral to the oral system. And again, as we had said, it's going to form a ring around the anus, and again, that anus was located about right here in the animal, all right, so right at the top of that central disc, and it's going to extend into the roof of each of the rays. Now, the tactile organs of this animal are going to be scattered over the surface, and tactile, of course, means touch, so they're very sensitive to touch, and they do have what we consider a very primitive eye spot or ocellus, sometimes we call it an ocelli, that's going to be at the tip of each of the arms. And I know in lab some of you um, did your best to try to find that ocellus at the tip of each arm, but because of the way that these animals were preserved, it was really difficult to find um, that eye spot. Now these animals are going to react to touch, they definitely will react to temperature, um, definitely react to the chemicals that might be found in the water, and because of that ocellus, light intensity is going to influence their activity as well. In fact, most of these animals will be active primarily at night. Now reproduction in this class is um, is again pretty straightforward. Uh, the sexes are separate, so you do have separate males and separate females, and the gonads for these animals are going to be found in each interradial space. So when they say interradial, they're talking about the rays that you would find on the animal. And over here on the right, you can see the gonads being identified as this um, blue area right through here. And you need to make really um, sure that you don't confuse those gonads with the um, pyloric cecum, which is um, this greenish stuff that you see right here. So when you dissect into your starfish, um, make sure you have a clear distinction between those two parts. Now, fertilization is external, so they will um, release gametes into the water. And um, typically, this is going to happen in the early part of summer. So they are seasonal in the way they reproduce. Now, in addition to reproducing sexually, <clears throat> they can also reproduce through regeneration. So if they're injured, if they're damaged in some way, if they happen to lose one of these arms, they can regenerate those lost parts. And there's even some um, echinoderms, for example, like the brittle stars, which can actually cast off that injured arm and regenerate a new one. So it's a really good defense mechanism against predators. Now it says an arm can regenerate a new sea star if at least one-fifth of that central disc is present. So you can, you can pretty severely damage these animals, and as long as one-fifth of that disc is still present, you can actually get a brand new starfish produced from that um, remaining piece of starfish. Now, if sexual reproduction has occurred, then the eggs that have been fertilized will first develop into what we call a bipinaria, larvae, and this is going to be a ciliated type of larvae because it is going to be considered free swimming. And you can see an example of this larvae right through here. It looks nothing like the adult starfish. And the cilia that you would find in these animals is going to be on the outer surface, and the cilia is going to be used to propel that um, larvae um, throughout the water. But now the larvae are going to grow adhesive arms and a sucker um, at the anterior end, and once they do that, they're going to change um, names, and they're going to be called brachiolaria larvae, and you can see an example of a brachiolaria larvae over here on the right. And again, you can see um, where those um, adhesive arms would be produced on the animal, and they would have adhesive suckers right at the end of these arms. Now, these brachiolaria are going to attach to the substrate through those adhesive arms, and they're going to undergo even another change, another type of metamorphosis, and transform into what we consider a radial juvenile. So what we're looking at is we're now looking at a larval form that has somewhat of that radially symmetrical nature that you would see in the adult starfish. And over here on the right, you can see that radial juvenile right here. You can see the arms sort of radiating from what we would consider a central disc um, for the starfish. Now the arms and the two feet are going to begin to appear. The animal will detach um, from whatever substrate that it was attached to previously as a brachiolaria larvae, and it's going to become essentially a young sea star. Now, as I had said, what I want to do is I want to make sure that we just talk a little bit about the other three classes that are found within the um, echinoderms. And the first class we're going to look at is the class Ophi uroidea, and this is going to be the class that actually contains the brittle stars. Now these animals are super secretive and they tend to live on the hard or sandy bottoms in their environment, and they really don't live in areas that have a lot of light. Now the arms of the brittle stars are very slender, and they're very distinct 
and when you look at them in comparison to the other starfish we've looked at, um, they still radiate from that central disk, but they definitely look very different. You can see an example of a brittle star um, ray right through here. Um, they definitely are very flexible, and instead of using um, the tube feet to um, move throughout their environment, the flexibility of these arms are going to be what they're going to use to actually pull themselves through the environment. Um, they do lack pedicellaria that we had seen on the sea stars or the papillae or those dermal branchia that we had seen in, in the other stars. Now the madreporite is going to be on the oral surface in this case and not the aboral surface. So we have a sort of a switch here and you can see the madreporite in this example right here. So again, normally this would have been on top of the animal in the brittle stars, it's going to be on the bottom. As we had said, the two feet are going to lack the suckers and the ampullae that you would find in those two feet. Now, the arms are going to be moved in pairs for locomotion. So as I said, that's going to be their primary way of getting through their environment. Now, they do have what we consider five movable plates that are going to act as jaws that are going to surround the mouth. And you can see these um, jaws located right through here. And so the mouth, of course, being this um, central area that you see right there. They do not have an anus, so any waste material that they produce that tends to be solid waste is going to be actually um, put back out through this mouth opening. Now the skin is going to be leathery and the surface cilia is going to be lacking in this group. Now the next class is the class Echinoideae and this is going to be the class that actually contains the sea urchins and another type of um, echinoid, which is going to be the sand dollars. And the sea urchins are those that are actually considered um, what we consider regular echinoids. In other words, they have the typical five-part symmetry that we had looked at that kind of characterizes this group. Um, but they do lack arms. But the test or the shell is what's going to actually demonstrate that five-part symmetry. Now, most of the sea urchins do have a hemispherical shape. When we say hemisphere, um, the best way to think about that is to think about sort of the planet Earth. I mean, obviously, it has hemispheres, and that's the shape that this animal is going to take on. And it's going to have, again, radial symmetry, and there's going to be very long spines that will protrude from that shell. And you can see those long spines being represented right here. Now, sand dollars do belong to this group, and instead of being sort of a regular type of echinoid, this is going to be considered an irregular echinoid because they don't really have that five-part symmetry that the sea urchins have. They have become what we consider bilateral in terms of their symmetry, but they do actually have short spines, and you can see a, a sand dollar right down here. Now, regular urchins are going to move by two feet, so kind of similar to what you had seen with the sea stars. An irregular urchin is going to move by its spines. Now echinoids occur from the intertidal regions, in other words those areas where the tide will go in and go out, to very deep ocean environments. Now the very last class is the class Holothroidae, and this is going to be the sea cucumbers. And these animals are the ones that actually don't really look like the other three groups that we've talked about. They have a greatly elongated oral aboral axis. In other words, if you notice, they simply look like a tube. Now, the ossicles, or those um, kind of calcareous plates that we had looked at in the sea stars, are extremely reduced in the um, sea cucumbers, and this has sort of given way to a very leathery type of body. Now, some species do crawl on the ocean floor, um, even though it's pretty slow. But others are primarily found under rocks or they may even burrow part of their body into the sandy areas of where they live. Now, what's really interesting about the sea cucumbers is that when these animals are irritated, what they will simply do to defend themselves is they will actually cast out part of their viscera. Now, the viscera is going to be primarily the digestive organs in these animals and could be other organs also. And if you notice down here to the right, all of the stringy material that you see right here would be considered eviscerated um, organs. And so in order for them to be able to survive, they have to be able to regenerate these tissues. So it's a defense mechanism. All right, so that's going to finish up our second and last screencast for Chapter 22. As always, please make sure that you have completed your screencast study guide before you come to class.